So people are beginning to come into the, uh, the room. We'll give folks just a few minutes to, uh, well, not a few minutes, but a few more moments to join us. And then we'll begin our program. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. All right, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, there are still people joining us and coming into the room, but we want to uh, not waste time. We wanna use each of the minutes that we have available to us. Um, so I want to welcome everyone. My name is Mario Brown. I direct the Office of Health Science, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in the Schools of the Health Sciences here at the University of Pittsburgh. And I am also the Interim Associate Dean for Equity, Engagement and Justice in our School of Pharmacy here at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we have a great uh, presentation for you today. We're very excited about our town hall series, uh, the first in what we hope to be a series of discussions. Uh, this title today is First Persons, First Peoples, Past and Present, Native Health and Voting Power. Um, so I want to just give you a quick description, uh, but before I do that, I just want to uh, give a couple of housekeeping uh, for everybody. Uh, please use the chat to interact with each other just as you are now, uh, stating where you're from. That's great. I love that. Um, you can use the chat to, uh, to make statements, to share information. If you have some information to share, we would ask you to use the Q&A uh, function to ask your questions. Uh, we will be monitoring both, but it would help the panelists a lot, a great deal, <clears throat> if you use the Q&A function um, to ask your questions. We will not be able to get to everyone's question just because of the, the sheer size of uh, the attendees today, um, but we will get to as many as we possibly can. So to begin our program, I'd just like to uh, uh, read something uh, for you all. Pittsburgh is known as a city with a rich colonial past, but the Native American perspective is often lost in the retelling of this history. Thus our students, many of whom are from Pittsburgh and broader Pennsylvania, as well as the Pittsburgh community will greatly benefit from learning about the native people who once lived here and the native community that now, that now calls this city their home. There is, little aware, there, there is so little awareness of what happened and Pittsburgh has never known, has never come to terms with say the massacre of uh, Nadine Hutton of the, of the Lenape people. That's virtually unknown. The tribes who were here, <clears throat> the Shawnee, the Lenape, the Delaware, the Seneca, to name a few, continue to exist, just not here. They were driven out and later removed to Oklahoma, to Canada, various places. Pittsburgh pays no mind to those who owned the land or what happened to them. I don't think anyone has ever apologized or invited uh, the tribes back. Meanwhile, the Three Rivers Indian Center and the Fort Pitt History Museum offer some toehold on this history and the present day. And what I just read came from one of our attendees today, one of my friends who uh, uh, shared some of that history with me. This event series will focus on elucidating the Native American past and present in Pittsburgh and across the United States. Beginning with a panel presentation speaking to the current health crisis effects on Native communities and the resiliency of Native people, this series will go on to examine topics like the intersection of Black and Native histories and genealogies. We join one another today, and I'd like to do this land acknowledgement. We join one another today on the land and near the rivers originally in the care and protection of the Adena and Hopewell nations, the Osage, the Osage people, uh, tribe, the Osage tribe, 
and the Monongahela peoples and shared since time immemorial by many indigenous nations, including the Delaware, the Iroquois, and the Shawnee tribes, as a place of gathering and exchange, as a process of rematriation, we acknowledge our connection to place and honor the land as a relative. Now I'd like to read the short the brief files and introduce uh, our panelists to you. Our very own Dr. Elena E. Roberts is an assistant professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research focuses on the intersection of African-American and Native American history from the 19th century to the modern day with particular attention to identity, settler colonialism, and anti-blackness. <clears throat> In addition to her forthcoming first book, I've Been Here All the While, Black Freedom and Native Land, University of Pennsylvania Press 2021, her writing has, has appeared in the Washington Post, the Journal of the Civil War Era, and the Western, uh, Western Historical Quarterly. Welcome, Dr. Elena Roberts. Next, uh, we have Dr. Gregory Evans Dowd. Dr. Dowd is Helen Hornbeck Tanner Collegiate Professor of History and American Culture at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Dr. Dowd is Chair of the Department of American Culture and a past director of the American Culture and Native American Studies Program. He has published several books and many articles on essays on the indigenous history of Eastern North America from the 16th to the mid 19th century. His scholarly interests include the study of race, rumor, religion, law, and other places where ideas and popular action meet. He has taught history at the University of Notre Dame the University of Connecticut, and the University of Witwater, Witwater's brand in Johannesburg, South Africa. He has held fellowships at the University of Michigan's Institute for the Humanities, the Newberry Library, Chicago, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, and with the Fulbright Program. He wrote an expert witness report and gave professional testimony and disposition for tribes in deposition, excuse me, for tribes in a treaty rights case in Michigan. He received his PhD in history at Princeton University in 1986 <clears throat> and his BA in history at the University of Connecticut in 1978. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Kimberly R. Heiser, Navajo Nation. Dr. Heiser is an associate professor of sociology at the University of British Columbia. She received her PhD in sociology from the University of Texas at Austin with an Indigenous Studies graduate portfolio and a traineeship from the Population Research Center. Her research seeks to gain a deeper insight into the social conditions that underline health, that undermine health, excuse me. She is dedicated to understanding the lives and life chances of Indigenous people. Welcome to our panelists and Dr. Elena Roberts, I turn the program over to you, thank you. You're on mute. Okay, I did it. So now no one else needs to do it since I did it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mario. So first, we're going to hear from Dr. Dowd, who is going to give us some historical context on how disease affected Native people right here in Pittsburgh during the colonial era. Thank you. Thanks for that great introduction. I've, uh, I just want to say I've done research at Pitt um, uh, in the great library there, and it's nice to speak to you. I zoom to you from the Huron Valley of Michigan, home to and lands of the Anishinaabeg peoples of Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, along with the Wyandot, Huron, and Wendat. I'm also zooming to you from about 45 miles west of Detroit, and it was there that a conflict began. Um, it's named for Pontiac. It wasn't really led by Pontiac, but that's a long story. In any case, there was a conflict that in which indigenous peoples drove out about nine of the British posts between Western Pennsylvania and Wisconsin uh, over the course of the uh, spring and early summer of 1763. Um, and I've been asked today to reflect on uh, the context that events at Fort Pitt in 1763 might provide for health disparities in the current pandemic, for instance. 
It may seem like a stretch, and in some ways it is, but in other very important ways, it is not a stretch at all. I will argue that the events at Fort Pitt in 1763, though they may not be typical of anything, are exemplary of a very uh, intense history. They exemplify our responsibility in the United States for the destruction of indigenous lives. So back to 1763. British officers uh, at Fort Pitt and in the surrounding area, some British North American colonists as well, were shocked at the indigenous power that was bringing down British forts across uh, the Great Lakes region and the Ohio Valley. And they wrote with imagination and with gusto of imaginative ways to kill Native Americans. And you see it in their letters. Colonel Henry Bouquet sought to use bloodhounds. Captain Simeon Okoye, who commanded at Fort Pitt, now Pittsburgh, sought to use beaver traps and crowfoot traps, as he wrote, pointed enough for their moccasins, end quote. Commander-in-Chief General Jeffrey Amherst, uh, further east, ordered several times that no prisoners be taken among the indigenous people. And British troops generally killed the Native Americans that fell into their hands alive. After a battle of Bushy Run, not far from Fort Pitt, the Pennsylvania Gazette reported that there was one prisoner taken from the indigenous people. And then, quote, after a short examination, he received his quietus. That means they killed him. At that battle was Colonel Henry Bouquet. Earlier that year, I'm sorry, earlier, before that battle, earlier that spring and summer in late June and July, as he and his troops had marched across Pennsylvania toward Fort Pitt, he corresponded with Sir Jeffrey Amherst. It's an infamous correspondence. It was only discovered in the 1860s by a researcher hired by Francis Parkman, who was working in London. Amherst had raised the possibility of disseminating smallpox among uh, the indigenous people from Fort Pitt. And Bouquet agreed to do so with blankets. And he notes, taking care, however, not to get the disease myself. Apparently, Bouquet had not yet had smallpox in his life. Already, however, by mid-June, and this is what's very curious, even before this correspondence took place, According to the journal of a commercial trader, William Trent, who was working out of uh, Fort Pitt and who was a captain in the militia, British colonial forces had already done this deed. At Fort Pitt, Captain Simeon Okoye, still waiting for Bouquet's forces, wrote that the neighboring Lenapes should be, quote, exterminated, end quote. And he wished he could do so, quote, in one single stroke, end quote. The story has often been told. Smallpox had broken out in his garrison and he knew enough about disease transmission. He knew enough about social distancing to quarantine the infected persons in a hospital to quote, prevent the spreading of that distemper. On June 24, 18, 1763, June 24, 1763, when two Lenape leaders, one was named Turtle's Heart, the other Mamalti, they visited Ikoye, the captain, that, the captain at Fort Pitt, they visited for talks, and Trent and Ikoye gave Turtle Heart and Mamalti as a, quote, present, end quote, two blankets, a handkerchief, and a linen, these items taken straight from the smallpox hospital. Trent wrote in his journal that he, quote, hoped it will have the desired effect, end quote. So that's a pretty full story, and that's um, worth dwelling on. Um, it's one of the odd things about this is that we have this correspondence from Amherst and Bouquet that takes place actually after the deed had been done at Fort Pitt, just a few days after, but it raises the possibility, as uh, Elizabeth Fenn of the University of Colorado pointed out 20 years ago, it raises the possibility that this kind of talk was far more widespread in the British Army than um, just this single episode. That's plausible and, and there's a certain logic to it. Horrible speculation, but it's plausible. 
But I want to dwell for a moment on a document, um, which though nothing more than a receipt, the kind of thing you bring back from the grocery store, brings to mind not only the ordinary horror of this event, but also raises, I think, the question of responsibility. And I want to thank here the late John M. Murrin, a great colonial historian, my advisor, and a victim of the current pandemic for bringing this to my attention when I was a graduate student long ago. So as I say, the document is a receipt. It is a charge against the crown, the sovereign. It was endorsed by General Thomas Gage, Jeffrey Amherst's replacement in 1764, and it was first published in 1941 in a Works Progress Administration and Pennsylvania Historical Commission edition of Colonel Henry Bouquet's papers, which are in the British Museum in London. One of the editors, Donald Kent, would later publish key portions of this again in 1956 in the forerunner to the Journal of American History. It is not obscure, but it is worthy of attention. And I'm gonna see if I can bring it up for you um, now. I don't know, can you, am I, am I sharing this? You can see it. Okay. Um, it's Dr. Dowd, if you want to enlarge it, you can. There you go. Okay, thank Perfect. you. So um, it's, I know it's difficult to read. Uh, I've quoted a key part of it to the right. Um, where you see the arrow on the top of the document, it points to the company um, that was being uh, reimbursed by the Crown. So this is a charge um, by a company, the Levy Trenton Company against the Crown. And uh, one of the charges in this receipt, in this list of items in the second arrow is, and I'll just read it, two sundries got to replace in kind those that were taken from the people in the hospital to convey smallpox to the Indians. That is two blankets, at 20 pounds, I mean, at two pounds, um, one silk handkerchief uh, and one linen. So the actors here are a company and its employees, the fictive sovereign, the crown and its agents. And then what I wanna speculate on is where we, the people of the United States fit in, because in my view, at least, um, we are the heirs to uh, the crown and carry that responsibility. Let's see, lower this. Now, um, is my screen okay? Thank you. It's closed. Um, so, um, the receipt implicates not some rogue British captain or some rogue frontier trader. It was endorsed by top British officers. And as I've just said, as a charge against the crown, it is also a charge, I think, against the people of the United States as we are the heir of, of the crown to its uh, resources and its responsibilities. We don't know with certainty that it worked. Um, we do know there was smallpox in the region what I want to do is instead of speculating on, on that is um, to consider this, the act was taken, the intent toward germ warfare was there. Even Donald Kent in 1956 noted, it cannot be condoned. And it was contrary to 18th century norms of European warfare, which frowned on such indiscriminate uncontrolled killing. So it's a fact that uh, officers acting under the crown both countenanced and attempted the indiscriminate destruction of indigenous lives through what we would today call germ warfare. The documentation is exceptionally strong. Did it happen at other times and elsewhere? We have scattered evidence, um, nothing absolutely certain, but we do have scattered evidence, and there is a whole historical discussion about that. I want to turn, however, um, especially in light of today and the pandemic, to, to another way of looking at this. Rather than seeing this event as typical or atypical, as unique or as ordinary, 
I want to see it as exemplary. That is, as an event that shines light on history and on the present, not because it was either typical or unique, but because it illuminates the question of responsibility for the destruction before their time of countless Native American lives. To put it bluntly, much as these individual colonizers were responsible for having executed warfare, we, the people of the United States, heirs to the British crown, the fictional sovereign, are responsible for the intentional destruction of untold numbers of indigenous lives by disease over the entire course of U U US history. Put it another way, when you set up the conditions for malnutrition, stress, exposure, environmental degradation, confinement, and exhaustion, you kill. This has direct resonance with examination of health disparities today. We can readily find far more lethal events than the Port Pitt, Port Pitt affair to which the United States can be held and has been held by historians to be directly responsible. Look briefly at removal um, in the 1830s. And ju let's just look at those indigenous peoples who lived say between where I am near Detroit and where you are, at least in my imagination, uh, near Pittsburgh. Jeff Osler has attempted to quantify the cost in lives of this federal policy of expulsion or removal. The Delaware population, heirs to Turtles Heart and Mamalti, fell from 3,000 to 1,000. The Shawnee population fell from 2,200 in the 1820s to 1,750 in 1853. A band of Ohio Senecas who numbered 550 in Ohio in the 1830s numbered only 300 in the 1840s, and US agents who accompanied their removal observed their many deaths, leaving one of those agents to write in his journal, I charge myself with cruelty to force these people on. And this is just to look at the peoples of the Ohio country between us. Over the course of US history, whether in California or at Bosque Redondo or in the Southeast or pretty much everywhere, one finds a heavy burden of responsibility. In the 1920s, a government report found death rates in federal boarding schools for Native American children to be far out of line with any comparables, and that was a government-funded report. During the expulsions of the 1830s, many of the officials and agents most directly responsible knew, especially after the experience of the Choctaws in 1830, 1831, that a great many indigenous people would die as a result of the forced expulsions and yet they carried on with them. So just to the question of responsibility, I would suggest, and I say this as an American citizen, that it is the people of the United States who are responsible for these premature deaths. We citizens of a republic, we who form the sovereign people of this republic, carry responsibility for the republic's actions including the expulsion and dispossession of indigenous peoples through means that led to conditions of malnutrition, widespread disease, premature death. Fort Pitt's blankets and handkerchiefs, its linen, they are real. But they are not alone. We can find plenty of other evidence for the crowns and for the republic's culpability in such premature death. Smallpox was eradicated. I had two vaccines when I was eight years old, a vaccine and then a follow-up booster. Um, it was a public health measure. And I think it's to public health and to the conditions of public health that we should turn and look if we really want to look at responsibility for um, such disparities. I saw on PBS NewsHour last night that whites are, white people are already being vaccinated at far higher rates than people of color. It's an interesting point. Um, Long-standing patterns and practices of discrimination in housing, education, healthcare, and employment, the stuff of systemic racism affect public health. And in a republic, we who are citizens should be responsible for this. We are responsible for it, whether we like it or not. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I think uh, Kimberly Heiser will have more to say that brings it right up to date. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Thanks so much. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Dowd, for such an informative talk. Uh, as a member of the history department, I am in a building on a street named for Henry Bouquet, which as someone who studies native history as a native person is very odd, very troubling. So in your opinion, I know you've listed kind of some broader issues um, that this country on a federal level certainly uh, can and should deal with, but on a smaller level, how might this city and this university just take responsibility for the Fort Pitt incident, for example? Well, so I don't know if I can speak exactly to that. I can speak to what I feel uh, we should be doing at Michigan, for instance, um, where we have similar issues. All, I think every, every place in America has these issues. And um, so I think, uh, you know, these acknowledgements are a good place to start. Um, but I also think just looking into the current practices, what is in your museums? What, what, what is, uh, how, how are you reaching out to indigenous communities that once were uh, neighbors uh, of, of Pitt? Um, we're trying to reach out uh, at Michigan. We're having some success, I think, um, in re uh, returning um, ancestors to, uh, to uh, surrounding peoples. But there's so much more that could be done. And a lot of it, I think, does have to be done on a, on a national level, a federal level. Um, so I'm not a politician. I don't have all the answers for that. Um, but I, but I, I, I do think attending to the history and taking it seriously and, and attending to the present um, is, is, is critical. Dr. Heiser, I saw you unmute. Did you want to respond to that as well? No, I, I not at this time. I think okay. some of my presentation will, will be a nice additive to what um, Dr. Down has presented. Definitely. Uh, well, so now we will hear from you, from Dr. Heiser, uh, whose work and activism in both Native health and political involvement are really so relevant in this moment only a few months after uh, the election and a week after the inauguration. So please, Dr. Heiser. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, and, uh, Kimberly Heiser, I'm coming, from you, coming to you from the unceded and ancestral lands of the Musqueam people in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, today, my presentation will be focused on uh, environmental racism and COVID-19 in indigenous communities in the, in the U.S. Southwest primarily, um, and I think it will dovetail quite nicely with Dr. Down's work, um, especially thinking about historical injustices that have set up the context um, now for, for people across the U.S., including indigenous peoples. And so, um, oh, and for the, the Navajos in the room, because there's always at least one, um, including myself, I'm a Shinhi, Nishlin, Philagana, Brashichin, Sin, Obikni, Dashiche, Bilagana Deshignale. So I'm the salt of the salt clan. Um, and I grew up in Windrock, Arizona, as well as in Upper Fula, New Mexico. And so let me talk to you about my work today. Let me share my screen. So the first thing I would like to do is just give a broad overview of where we are right now and what we know about who is being affected by COVID-19. And, and as discussed earlier at different points today, racial and ethnic minorities and including um, poor communities have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. When it comes to native peoples in the United States, they're the most likely to contract COVID, experience hospitalization and die from COVID-19 compared to other racial and ethnic groups. And in fact, native peoples are about three, over three times more likely to experience COVID-19 than non-Hispanic whites in the US. And this is just looking nationally. And as we think about um, native peoples and as um, the previous presenter talked about um, and also in the land acknowledgement of, of where indigenous peoples historically have been and where they are contemporarily are not exactly the same thing. So, but when we think about disease and we, we think about occurrence of disease, especially for indigenous peoples, one of the things I'm interested in thinking about is where, where, where are these people that we're, we are 
um, concerned about. Where is the population residing? So this map is from the US Census that just plots where um, people who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native, either alone or in combination, are located in the United States. And you can see in the darker blue um, counties, that's where a higher proportion of the population identifies as Native American. And as you can see, one of the, um, the federal campaign of moving um, Native peoples west of the Mississippi um, in some respects has been highly successful, right? It's because the, the trends still are a higher proportion of folks who identify are west of the Mississippi. Um, but that, that displacement is, is um, a topic for an important conversation, but not the centrality of my talk today. So what I wanted to highlight is where indigenous people are right now, uh, as far as self-identifying in um, the United States in the darker blue, but also where the highest mortality rates in the US are for indigenous peoples. And this is the absolute highest rate of um, over 400 deaths per 100,000 people. And this, this came from the AP, APM um, Research Lab and that this data comes from, and they source data from the CDC. So what we can see is there is some overlap in um, where the highest mortality rates from COVID are, as well as um, where indigenous peoples are concentrated as far as county level goes. And so as we consider, con continue to think about location of where they are, we see a disproportionate, um, expo a disproportionate mortality in these states, but also then it gets us to think about, or at least for me, thinking about the context in which individuals are living and the kinds of resources and exposures that they um, are exposed to. And so my colleagues and I were particularly interested in looking at the Southwest. And so I have a couple slides to show you all to, to see what our general early findings. This data from COVID um, was from May of 2020. So the first study that we did is we looked at the Navajo Nation. And as we all said, I, I am Diné and I grew up in, on the Navajo Nation. And the Navajo Nation in um, early, early summer, late spring, the Navajo Nation had the highest um, COVID rate in the world. And so we became interested in trying to think about what is the context, the social context and, and the environmental context in which native people live, in particular Navajo people live, and um, what, what kind of limitations or barriers are there in um, mitigating spread of COVID-19. So one of, there's two primary recommendations, right, of mitigating um, COVID-19 spread is wearing a mask and washing, the, washing your hands. One of the things that I know from growing up on the Navajo Nation is all households do not, do not have running water or access to clean water. And so we became interested in wondering whether or not there is an association between um, the abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation, which communities near abandoned uranium mines often don't have clean um, water to be accessed. And we also were curious about access to gr grocery stores and hospitals um, for accessing uh, supplies as well as um, for care for hospitals. So this map is the Navajo Nation at the county level where we have maps of the grocery stores, the hospitals and the landmines. And so, or the abandoned mines, I'm sorry. Um, and what you can see here is that there is distribution of these things across um, particularly the abandoned uranium mines concentrated in Navajo County and uh, particular. And also I want to note that there's only seven grocery stores across the Navajo Nation um, for a land area that's as large as West um, Virginia. And so there are certainly challenges when it comes to um, food resources for people living in the community. So what we found here is that counties with high numbers of abandoned uranium mines are also areas with high um, number of COVID, confirmed COVID-19 cases despite having lower population density and lower population size. So Navajo County and Apache County are pretty similar in terms of um, some of their housing characteristics. But the big difference between the two counties is the, the number of abandoned uranium mines. So we continue to think about um, 
um, COVID-19 in the Southwest. And we looked at Arizona in spe specifically to think about the role, because we know that um, poor communities are also seeing a, a dis disproportionate um, number of cases. So we looked in Arizona to see what the association between the impact of uh, concentrated disadvantage. So this is an algorithm of multiple measures, including uh, poverty rate, unemployment, and a female headed household, and, and also education level and their association with um, COVID-19. So initially we found a significant positive relationship. So increasing levels of concentration, concentrated disadvantage and increasing number of native people was associated with higher COVID cases. However, once we added housing conditions, that um, was partially explained. So the housing conditions in particular are houses without complete plumbing in, in their homes. So, and we also found that households with um, limited English speaking ability also tended to have higher um, COVID cases as well. So here, not only is this study highlighting the role of, of concentrated disadvantage, but also the role of uh, plumbing in one's home, as well as English speaking ability to get to, to um, receive education on mitigation. Lastly, I wanna talk about our work in New Mexico, where we're able to, again, add um, ur abandoned uranium mines into the study. So in this study, we found um, a couple different things. The first is the percentage of population who are racial and ethnic minorities, as well as the percentage of households who were crowded. So this is more than one person in the household. We're significantly more likely to experience um, COVID-19. The second is that we, we found that the percent of the population without health insurance was also significantly associated with um, COVID-19. And finally, the housing infrastructure continues to be a theme here in New Mexico as well, where we found housing units without telephone and without complete plumbing were more likely to um, experience COVID-19. In, those, in, those, in this case, it was in these zip codes. And so as we can kind of think about COVID-19 and, and its spread across communities, one of the things that we really, our work we hope to stress is not so much individual thinking, but thinking about the structure in which people live and the environments in which people are making their choices. And so first of all, for native communities, it may be difficult for them to practice quarantine in home, especially since they have crowded, more crowded households. Um, and so family members may be less likely to be able to quarantine. So out of home safe quarantine space becomes incredibly important. The second is the lack of health insurance might be a barrier, which is an interesting finding given, um, depending on what state you live in and your healthcare system, the testing may not have direct costs but it still signifies a barrier, a barrier to either testing or a barrier to healthcare. And so it's something that we as a society have to consider as well. And finally, this really highlights the importance of investing in household infrastructure, especially for indigenous peoples. Um, I don't know how widely known it is that, um, like in, in, on Navajo in some communities, 40% of the, community do not have running water in the house, right? And so how, how then do we do these mitigation of washing our hands? And also if you're, you are then forced to go somewhere to get water, right? You're having to then um, leave your home to get water and additional resources. So it highlights the importance of investing in household infrastructure, including plumbing and also um, a telephone. So I have other work as uh, Dr. Robert mentioned on uh, voting, as well as civic engagement among Native peoples, which I'm happy to talk about in the panel. I just wanted to focus in on uh, what the environmental racism work that I have done in COVID-19 in Indigenous peoples. And these are the three papers in which um, my, my presentation has been based upon. So I look forward to the discussion with, with everyone. Thank you, Dr. Heiser. 
Well, if I could just ask my question, um, your talk really made me think about how, first of all, as you all know, the media coverage of Native people and Native issues is dismal. Um, I think it did get a little attention um, during kind of COVID period, um, which is not yet over, about how, um, how horrible things have been, especially on the reservations, um, how poverty and structural issues, as you said, have affected um, this. But then there are also success stories in Indian country, right? Like the Cherokee Nation, uh, my nation, the Chickasaws, they have managed to produce PPE for their tribal citizens, for other residents of Oklahoma. Um, how would you like to see Americans discuss both the needs and successes of Indian country, which is so diverse? I, that's an excellent question. I think there's a couple different things. Like one of the things that I think is important that is an individual that can easily be done by individuals is two things is like learn the first people that you of the land that you live on and where they are right now like to move to to be able to entertain indigenous peoples both as the in the past and in the present because one of the difficulties that i find in my classes and in my presentations is i still regularly meet people who are like oh you're still here like Yes, we are all still here. So if we can make that leap from the past to the present, I think that will um, be immense. But also I think um, I think that at an in individual level can be done and will make um, a difference because then you, you become aware of what has happened and what, could, what kinds of change could happen. But also I think that in, in entertaining the present of Native, who Native peoples are is acknowledging the both the joys, both the joys and the sadness in the in what the life experience, our life experiences are like, right? So on one hand, acknowledging that the the U.S. has not has not um, held up its end on tribal on its treaty agreements, right? We were that part of the agreement of the land exchange was for housing and for education and for healthcare. And at the very least, my studies indicate that we might, and indigenous peoples may not be receiving those at a basic level, right? The housing is incomplete. Um, access, to edu access to healthcare is incomplete. Um, I have other work on education, but that's also incomplete. And so I think there's seeking justice there, but also as you mentioned, doc Dr. Robert is also the resilience and wonderfulness that is happening. Because I think one of the things that is also amazing as the US struggles to figure out how to um, disseminate the vaccine, there are tribal communities who have done an excellent job already in, dis in um, their dissemination of the vaccine. So even though um, resources are, sh are, are less in indigenous communities, there seems to be a systematic approach um, to vaccine approach for elders in the community that I think the rest of the U.S. can learn from. Definitely. Um, and I, I do feel like the Cherokee Nation has gotten some attention as to, yes, how can we kind of look at this nation and what they're doing um, and possibly follow kind of those lessons. Um, but going to what you said about how can we kind of remember and teach people that, you know, Native people still exist. Um, I think there was a moment with the election that people realized Native people are a powerful block. Like, look at how they've swung certain states. Do you feel like this is a moment in which that could possibly become realized? Like, um, not just kind of a fleeting moment? I would love it if it became real, real, realized across. Because I think one of the things, I think New Mexico, Arizona, South North and South Dakota have always known that um, and Oklahoma, right? The, the places where there's high concentration of indigenous people, they've always known that they're a powerful voting bloc, right? And even, even in, um, if you look at um, some of my work from earlier elections also suggest that native peoples vote during congressional years, right? And so there is actually over presidential years, like if you're gonna pick or choose one, my my research would suggest native people pick the congressional years to turn out over the, um, possibly over the presidential. This one, there was more turnout, but, um, so that makes me think that 
um, indigenous peoples are very aware of who their direct representatives are and who will shape their tribal, um, who will be advocating for tribal needs and community needs. And so I think one of the things that I hope um, comes out of this is that we become more aware of the tribal voting blocks and communities in, uh, across the US, right? Because they, they were important in, in Minnesota and Georgia, you know, like all over in places that do have strong communities, but it, there may not be have the same proportion as in like the Southwest. And so I would, I would love it if, if indigenous peoples continue to be a powerful voice. Cause I think there are certain areas in, in politics that um, native people have always had a voice where people pay attention, but now it's getting a little bit more national and also at, during presidential elections. Mm. Definitely, thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, kind of open it up and look at some of your questions, um, you as attendees. Now, a lot of people have asked kind of about Pittsburgh native history. Um, so Dr. Dowd, if I could ask you kind of a broad question, would you say there is a lot of work um, that attendees could access on kind of pre-colonial and native history? Does the record uh, seem to really start like when colonization occurs? Like, could you kind of give us a broad overview of Pittsburgh native history? Yeah, yeah there, there, there is a rich historical scholarship on, on Pittsburgh and um, it's, it's, it's an interesting one because, um, you know, especially uh, in the years immediately before and uh, after the American Revolution, Pittsburgh was a kind of a hinge. Uh, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a very, it was a key uh, site of contest between empires among indigenous peoples for, uh, you know, retaining sovereignty and power. Um, so, there's a fairly recent book by Stephen Harper, um, which which is is uh, is is a good book on uh, on 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 the Pittsburgh area. It's called Unsettling the West, and it's about how indigenous peoples were unsettled by uh, colonists. Um, and it's it's a it's a fine book. Um, I I think uh, that um, you know so there are there are along with Unfortunately, Pittsburgh has, um, you know, it, it not only has this Fort Pitt episode, but it has, uh, as was mentioned in, in the introduction, um, it has the dubious distinction of uh, being associated with uh, the massacre, the atrocity at Naddenhutten in Ohio, uh, because it was militia, not from Pittsburgh exactly, but from, uh, I think, uh, Washington County um, in Western Pennsylvania, who um, slaughtered uh, 90 to 100 um, Moravian, Christian, Mahican, and Delaware Indians, uh, Native people, in cold blood after having disarmed them, um, men, women, and children, uh, in 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 a truly you know, and it, I, I don't use this word lightly, but a truly genocidal act. Um, and uh, it, 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 it strikes me, one of the things that strikes me about um, not just Pittsburgh, but Southern Ohio, Kentucky, uh, much of Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, a region we don't normally associate with, you know, sort of violence, the erasure of native peoples, the removal of na native peoples from this area, from these areas were very thorough. There's still indigenous peoples in all these areas, by the way. And of course, indigenous peoples have migrated back and live in cities and their Indian centers and their thriving uh, communities. Um, but in terms of federally recognized tribes, very few. And um, it's, it's, it's a mark of uh, the power of uh, removal and expulsion from this rich agricultural land. Um, uh, so that's a, that's a part of the history too, is just the, um, the quest for great agricultural land, 
uh, that occupied settlers in the early 19th century and led to indigenous destruction and, and expulsion and survival, but in the West generally, and then remigration in the 20th century. Some pockets remaining to be sure. So yeah, it's, I don't know if that's an overview. It, it's great. I mean, uh, I think Pittsburgh has such kind of a, a rich history um, of native people and then also of the interactions between native people um, and colonial powers that I feel like is not as known as it could be or should be. Uh, we have several museums that kind of have those kinds of exhibits. Um, but I, I've heard from my students here at Pitt that they don't teach this in K through 12. Um, they don't always get it in college depending on which classes they take. One great document, just sorry. 1778 what? treaty, we mentioned treaties. There was a idea that the Delaware nation might become a separate state in a 1778 Delaware treaty, just something to think about. Mm. I mean, there are a lot of great primary sources for this region for sure, so. Dr. Roberts, I just want to uh, make a statement and ask people that are raising your hands, please post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we won't be responding to raised hands. I'm looking at them now. Uh, Jeremy Hugh, excuse my mispronunciation if I mispronounce anyone's names, um, asked a question that I could possibly pose to both of you, maybe um, more to Dr. Heiser. Uh, so he talks about public health. Uh, how do we address the public health system's historical injustices against First Peoples, such as the forced sterilizations that IHS performed on Indigenous women as late as the 70s? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> where do you begin, right? But, um, but I think there's, there's, I think there's a couple different approaches to the public health. Like for one, for one, let's fully fund healthcare to um, tribal people. <laughs> Cause I think that some, not in this case, the sterilization was a different um, campaign, but some of the some of the issues that from a public health perspective that we read into is partially um, a lack of resources and funding. And so if we can, so if the US is able to honor its side of the treaties and provide adequate funding, that would be one thing that would be helpful as well as investing um, also for um, self determinations for tribes to invest in their health and healthcare as the community and tribal and the tribal stakeholders feel appropriate. Because I think there is some of that with the 638 hospitals in IHS. However, um, the way it's functionally working as I see it personally, is it's a way for IHS to not have responsibility for those hospitals anymore. Um, so it's, it's a budgetary issue as opposed to what I, what I think the hope from it was to be more self-determinant. And for some hospitals, it is the case for tribes that have um, revenue sources that can fund it. And so, for one, I think we need to fund we need to fund healthcare as well as public health initiatives because we do know from health economy research that the long term we we save more money, we reap more benefits when we invest in public health and preventative care as opposed to. Um, once disease and illness has onset, right? And so that's a shift in, in our perspective in the US overall, right? To shift from disease management to, di to disease prevention. That could also happen. But also as far as the specific instance of the sterilizations, like I think one, it should be acknowledged that this campaign did occur and it was, and it was also forcible in the sense that women were forced, but also in the sense that women were unaware that this, this happened to them. Like they didn't discover they were sterilized until later on when they were wanting to have additional children. That's when they discovered, right? And so I think that the level of deception there is, is not okay. And so acknowledgement of this is also important in, in building trust again. Thank you. So we have a few questions that I think I could combine to kind of form a question for both of you about uh, working with native communities. 
um, yourselves. So for Dr. Heiser, um, Joshua Pogue asked, um, what advice do you have for outsiders moving into native areas to provide patient care? Like how would you kind of suggest working with native communities to respect their traditions um, and ideas as well as kind of providing them care? Um, and then I would pose that um, after to Dr. Dowd. Um, you know, now how have you worked um, with native communities um, in your position as chair, as well as in your own research? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that um, in my work with native peoples and also for when I bring um, non-native people with me to these, these, these times is what's important is to, for me, is an approach of humility and listening. Because one of the things that I think, especially science in general, whether it's uh, medicine or social science or other kinds of science, kind of, there's a history of going in as the expert and telling people how to fix things. You know, whereas actually there's a lot of knowledge to be gained and amplified in the community already. And so it's more about academic knowledge. To my view is academic knowledge and medicine is there to support the wisdom that already exists and to amplify it. And so for new folks and people coming in wanting, wanting to help, I think what's important is to arrive humbly and listen and to do a lot more learning through listening and watching than as opposed to asking a question. Because um, indigenous worldviews and, and teaching is different in that way. So sort of, um, Western culture and white culture tends to have like you learn by asking Whereas indigenous cultures, you learn by watching and doing, right? And so it's a different approach of learning. And so that's what I would, um, that's what I advise and that's how I work, how I, how I work with um, tribal communities is trying to show up and figure out how my work will um, amplify what is already happening as opposed to replacing. I think I can, well, I can't add much to that. And of course, compared to uh, Professor Heiser, I, I do less work directly with indigenous communities in my research. Certainly it's mainly archival. My, as a, a, it, but as, as a member of a university community uh, who has um, recognized largely because of my students, largely because of the prodding of Native American students who's recognized that um, we've got work to do in order to build uh, relationships with Michigan native communities. Um, I've, I've, we, I, I think that the, what I've learned is, and a, a colleague suggested this to me as, as a form, remember you're a guest. Um, remember that you're, and, and not a guest who wants to be served, um, but a guest who is, in someone else's space and uh, should really pay attention to the expectations of, uh, of, of those people uh, to have respect and honor for them. Um, it's, um, it's very key in, uh, and, and, and in, in our university, I'll just dwell for a moment on the um, issue, of, issue of NAGPRA um, which is uh, the issue of human remains held at the University of Michigan uh, because there, there were a great many. And um, over the past decade, really, um, we have uh, been working hard. We've got a committee um, that helps to uh, push the university and, and the university has been eager to comply really to um, to uh, return ancestors to indigenous communities and to work that out, um, to get, get to, to help facilitate indigenous communities agreements on to whom the remains should be returned, the ancestors should return and to, to, to help work this out. So taking concrete steps, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Heiser, uh, uh, suggested that uh, paying attention to treaties is important. I agree with that too. Um, the question of expertise is indeed fraught in work. I have been an expert in a hunting and fishing rights case, which I find in some ways absurd. I'm a guy from the suburbs. What do I know about hunting? 
Um, and uh, I know a lot about historical research. Um, but so, so being deferential, listening, paying attention, recognizing your limits. Um, and those get bigger in my own mind with each passing year. Um, I'm talking too much. You're not talking too much. We're here to be educated. Uh, so several people have brought up uh, things that kind of you can do on an individual basis uh, to perhaps kind of provide um, a sort of a source of reparations, I guess I would um, say in a sense. And so there are efforts that you uh, may be already familiar with to, uh, for instance, pay rent to indigenous people whose land uh, city residents are living on. Uh, what do you think of those kinds of actions taken on an individual level, both of you? I like the I like the thought of it. I guess I'll put that, I'll put that way because I do think that sort of that to 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 um, boil some of the tenets of these treaties down is that that non non native people should be paying rent to indigenous people either at least in the forms of education um, education housing healthcare right. Um, but also, I think now that our society is as it is, there there may be this direct economic way to look at it too, and so it's something to consider. I think one of the things that we have to, in terms of reparations and making good for um, these instances that have happened, especially along the East Coast where tribes have been removed, tribes are disconnected from their history, as and individuals are disconnected from their history, and some. Um, some and some communities that have been, become extinct, right? That those things, those things, I think, will take additional thought to um, additional thought than just paying a monthly rent, right, to something. And so, I do think there is structural things that could be addressed in a way um, that would be useful for both at the state and the federal level. Um, but I, I, I like the, the train of thought there with, with the paying of rent, I guess I'll say that. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. I, I am uh, interested in the concept of responsibility, which is a word I used um, a lot, and um, sort of na national responsibility of our people as a nation all of us um, to, uh, to, to try in some ways to uh, address um, the wrongs of the past um, and the enormous wrongs of indigenous dispossession, of slavery, and um, how exactly, I mean, there has been a rich discussion in the last decade, um, well, longer than that, but it's become very alive in the last decade in the politics um, over reparations in, in terms of um, enslavement. And um, I, 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 I find it, you know, it, it's, it's far more sophisticated than the idea of writing a check and sort of settling things once and for all with a, with, with a check. Um, uh, that, might be, that might be a good idea, but, but, there's, but as, as I think Professor Heiser is, is, is gesturing, or at least as I would gesture, there are, um, there are many other ways uh, in terms of policy, in terms of uh, just recognition and respect, in terms of honoring those treaties, which by the way, I mean, a treaty is like a deal. It was a bad deal. It was usually forced on these people, but at least honoring it um, and uh, recognizing that, you know, as a US citizen, I get benefit out of this treaty. It's not as if, the indigenous person has special privileges. They have treaty rights and I have treaty rights. Um, I get to live here. <laughs> and um, so I think, I think that this is, at, le at very least, um, you could, we, we could start with things like honoring treaty rights and recognizing the presence of indigenous people in America and their active presence and creativity and uh, 
and you know, is it, it often in some cases even flourishing and celebrating that. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think, I think, I think that there, this is a, a discussion that needs to go on. I think it's an important discussion. Well, on that kind of note of uh, reparations, how Americans should kind of uh, deal with their history. Um, and as you said in your presentation, kind of the history that comes before it um, of the British. I know this may be perhaps out of your comfort zones, but uh, some people in the chat are kind of talking about different communities, people of color um, and how they should perhaps think of their like relationships to native people. Do they have kind of that same um, responsibility? I guess using your term, Dr. Dowd. Um, kind of an incomplete question, but like, what would you think of those kind of intersections and how uh, we might think of those? Well, well, one of the things that initially comes to mind in the ways that um, especially elders speak to me is that we are all relatives, you know? And so we have mutual responsibility to each other. And, um, and to acknowledge our histories. So I think that's sort of where we start. So even, so even communities of color living on indigenous land, right, part of their benefit of being there is also at this historical legacy of, of the treaties as well, right? Um, and so there, I think there, I think we need to have deep and hard conversations and be willing to be uncomfortable with the fact that um, the ways the ways that communities are um, disenfranchised and pivoted against one another does not, um, I guess I'm not interested in a like, whose trauma is worse conversation, but really like acknowledging each other's traumas and each other's struggles against power and finding ways in which through that mutual acknowledgement, a path forward, right? Because I think that the ways in which um, power and white supremacy has pivoted communities of color against each other is partially by a slightly different exploitation of each of them, right? And so um, I think I think we're all relatives, and we are we are responsible to one another. And um, there's a path forward in in that to me. It's beautifully said. I mean, I um, don't know that I can add add to that. I would just observe that um, in my limited experience, um, communities of color actually tend to take a little more responsibility. Um, and, uh, you know, often it's because of necessity or out of necessity um, and off, uh, but, but in any case, for whatever reason, um, so I, I would, I would not advise what, as, as, as a white American, I can't give that kind of advice. Um, but what I, what I can, uh, celebrate is what, um, Professor Heuser just said about our interrelationships and, um, uh, you know, that, that I think it, it would behoove and benefit all of us to, um, to shoulder this responsibility. Thank you. Turning to another topic, uh, there is a senior, undergra uh, senior undergraduate capstone class in attendance, so welcome you all. Um, they ask for any advice for researchers interested in the intersections of, uh, I think it's gender, sexuality, and women's studies and indigenous studies, and I might open that up to uh, just kind of how would you, what advice would you give to people wanting to pursue Native studies academically? do it. But also in addition to that, um, <laughs> is that I also think for the US, people who are studying in the US, what's important for indigenous studies is to read more broadly outside of the US. Because especially in terms of gender, sexuality, indigenous studies, like Canada has a lot more going on than the US, in my view of 
the U.S. literature. And so I think that that will be, I think that for me is for indigenous studies in general, it's important to read widely um, when it comes to indigenous studies, because I think that the U.S. still struggles with the concept of settler colonialism and how it works and manifests in the U.S., whereas I think other countries have taken that on um, more directly than the U.S. has, so we have a lot to learn from other, scholar, other Indigenous scholars around the world. Phillips, say go for it. Dr. Roberts, I wanted to ask a, a question. It, it's actually posed in the chat, but I wanted to bring you in on this as well. And the reason I wanted to ask it is because it resonates uh, with me a great deal with some work I've done in the past. One of the uh, uh, questions in the chat were in the uh, Q&A ask about, are there any cultural or social actions being taken uh, regarding, uh, regarding indigenous people who have forgotten their ancestry uh, over, the, over time, um, but may still suffer negative consequences. And the reason I asked that, I worked on an underground railroad uh, project and I rode, um, we rode bicycles basically through the deep south all the way up to uh, Canada. But when we sat and talked to local people, sat on porches and drank uh, iced tea with folks and we wore our underground railroad shirts and we talked about abolitionist movements and things of that nature that were happening up north, Many people ask us, well, how do you know that? And it struck me that many people uh, don't know parts of their, uh, of their history in this country uh, still, and some of that may be to our education system. But I wanted to, uh, to really surface that question posed in the, in the Q&A because I have seen it in black communities. And I wonder if that exists as well in uh, native communities, indigenous people. Um, well, I could I could give my opinion, and then and then Dr. Dowd and Dr. Heiser could as well. <laughs> uh, so I, I think there is kind of an interesting parallel there with especially Black and Native history, um, because there have been concerted efforts on the part of uh, White Americans in various forms to dismiss those histories and to hide those histories. And it's really only relatively recently, I'd say, I don't know, the last fifteen to twenty years. Um, that those histories have kind of been able to uh, be studied by people seriously and taken seriously, um, that we have really begun to teach them kind of on the highest level at universities. Um, and I think it's, it's important to remember that it's not kind of a failure of those groups of people that they don't know their own history um, for both Black and Native people. And there is a revitalization effort in both Black and Native communities to kind of find and relearn that history. Um, and I think that more attention should be kind of paid to those, um, especially on the ground and not just kind of on the academic level. Dr. Dowd? Well, so I, I, I don't have an answer to this. And I, I think about it because I do think a lot about the question of genealogy and question of inheritance. And, um, and these are really interesting questions. Um, you know, there's this phrase that is in my mind, the rich have ancestors, the poor have grandparents. And, um, you know, there's, there's some truth to that. Interestingly enough, in indigenous communities, sometimes even the poor know their ancestors way back because the records under federal surveillance are so good. Um, but, um, and for other reasons too, other cultural reasons, but, um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about teaching a course on family history, just so that people could look into their family history and know it more because you can learn so much about us history by looking at family history and comparing family histories against one another. Um, so I, I think it's a serious question. Um, uh, how have identities changed over time? What, what gets buried, what gets driven down? Yeah, I, but I, I don't know if I have an answer or advice to give 
you know, people who are looking or who know or who suspect that they have. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely worth exploring. Thank you for allowing me to ask that question, Dr. Rob. Dr. Heiser, did you want to respond to that? Uh, sure. <laughs> well, I think I think the general sentiment I completely agree with um, what has been said thus far. I think what I I think um, as a demographer in studying the census, I think one of the things I want to throw in as a as a uh, consideration to this conversation is um, motivations for learning history because I think. Unfortunately, indigenous communities um, experience a lot of ethnic fraud that happened as well, and ethnic fraud that um, that that buoys people's careers, you know, in academia and elsewhere. And so, I feel as though indigenous peoples have been interacting with settlers and immigrants for like more than like twenty generations. So there's a good chance there's native history there in your family lineage. Um, so I guess the question that I pose is sort of, it, is, is doing some examination of motivation because um, I think indigenous communities themselves, we have seen a lot of exploitation both in terms of culture and identity. And so um, I just, wanted to throw that out there because I, I am very supportive of people wanting to reconnect to their family histories and their understandings, but I also want individuals to acknowledge the power dynamics in entering that conversation um, and what, what it is the motivational factor is because I also think there has been intentional federal policy to ensure Native peoples are, dis are severed from their people and their histories having to do with, you know, displacement, historical displacement, but also through residential schooling and, and over-representation in foster care. So there has been federal and state intentional severing that we want to heal. But at the same time, I'm cautious of anyone being like, I'm indigenous now, you know, because of the power dynamics that are inherent in our society. Totally agreed. Mario, did you have any other questions that you wanted to point out? I think I've gotten to most of these. So some of the chat, uh, you know, there's been lots of conversation uh, in the chat um, uh, amongst people. And, and some of it is a call to what more can the University of Pittsburgh do? But I will broaden that to say what more can uh, uh, the academy do to um, make right the wrongs um, within the power of the university, within the power of the academy. What more uh, should we be doing? Um, and this is more of an activist question than a than a uh, strictly an intellectual one. Is there more that we could be doing? Yes, um, we need more indigenous scholars. Um, we need more um, scholarship on, in, uh, on indigenous history and it needs to be, uh, you know, it, 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 it needs to take into account multiple perspectives. Um, and uh, I, I, I think, Institutions also need to um, look into their institutional histories and see where, um, you know, was there a land gift that uh, helped to bring the university about and did that come from uh, indigenous peoples? That's the case with mine. Um, uh, who built the university? That is who laid the bricks? Um, that would be another question. But these are the kinds of questions that I think institutions are beginning to look into and, and should take seriously um, to connect uh, their pasts with those of the greater United States um, or Canada. Um, and uh, I, I, yeah, I think this is 
this is something we as universities can do. Yeah, I'll just add to what um, Dr. Depp has said is, I think, do think there is a lot more to be done and I do think there needs to be more indigenous and people of color across academia. But one of the things that I think academia has to come to reconciliation with is their own inherent um, biases, especially toward what is an expert and what is knowledge. Because if we want more indigenous, for instance, indigenous um, faculty, we may have to consider that these individuals may not have PhDs. And we have to consider what that would mean for our academic programming, you know? Um, and because right now, right, like I have my PhD in sociology, I have been the only P, the only Native woman in all of my departments that I've ever been in, the, no, the only Indigenous person. And so that's a problem, you know? And when I was in the United States, I was the only Indigenous the only indigenous woman with tenure in a sociology department in the country. There's other sociologists, you know, in other departments like ethnic studies, American Indian studies, et cetera, that have tenure. But when I was in the US, I was the only one in sociology who was an indigenous woman with a full appointment in sociology. And so there are things there that academia has to reckon with itself. You know, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know if we do in fact want people of color in academia, we have to consider what we consider expertise and what is knowledge to pass on. That it may not be, I'll just give myself the PhD from the University of Texas in Austin, right? As wonderful as that is, um, maybe it looks like something else, you know? And I think that's a conversation we need to have. And especially since our universities are producing more PhDs than we can employ, like maybe there's other kinds of training we need to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I just wanted to address that layer of what institutions could do. There's certainly much more, especially at the student level, like there's things we can do to support indigenous students that um, don't exist wide stream, but there are great models at liberal arts schools and, and um, primarily indigenous serving schools that could be used elsewhere. Um, but if we're gonna look at academia itself, then um, that's what I would bring to the table. Well, Pitt is the Ooh. land grant institution, the first iteration of this university, yes. Um, and yet there, there is no kind of active recruitment of Native faculty or Native elders, Native cultural um, providers. So, yeah, it's certainly something to think about. That was very powerful. Of all the powerful things that you all have said, that was definitely one of the most, from my perspective as a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional, and this whole idea of inclusive excellence. Well, what does that look like and who defines that? Um, and I think, uh, I don't know, Dr. Roberts, I think uh, Dr. Heiser just set the stage for a, a, a another dialogue there um, that we need to have. Thank you for that. Definitely. Um, oh, the question is gone. Uh, okay, so um, maybe this might be your last question. Uh, so David Friedman asked, wondering if speakers could speak to the connection between naming space in relation to native people's history. What comes to mind immediately within Allegheny County is Settler's Cabin. What is the impact of rewriting or renaming locations such as this on a local, state, and federal level? So how does place naming really kind of change the way people think about locations and how does that kind of erase Native people? Well, I'll just say um, at least there are some beautiful indigenous words associated with Pittsburgh. I mean, one has to love the word Monongahela, um, and Allegheny. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I'll just I'll just start there. Um, this is, involves the whole question of memorial and monuments and memory and public memory, and uh, you know it's 
it's a it's a conversation that needs to go on and it will be always changing uh but it's important i like the question i don't have a direct answer I'll just add, I think names are important, you know, as, as Dr. Dow said that names are important, but I also think one of the things that the US is unique in compared to other countries in the US, like we are a monolinguist society, right? And that's like, that's rare. There's no other country that I can think of off the top of my head that's that way. And so as we, maybe we want to rename things, that would be great. I'm in support of that, but also I think that also means we should learn to say the, them correctly, um, which we are all, we are capable of doing. It may be hard, especially for someone like me who only speaks English and, and will, when I get confused, add vowels to things, I, I can still do it, right? We'll still learn it. And so I think that's the part that I think with the settler colonialism framework that we have to think about is, is that we have to be willing to learn other languages and the value of other languages. Because one of the things that you'll see uh, that I saw, at least in my time in Texas, the road, um, I'm gonna say it incorrectly, but I'm gonna try. Guadalupe was a main road, but no one called it as, as a Spanish speaker would call it. They called it Guadalupe, right? And so I think we can name things after what, original people's call things, but we also need to support each other in knowing how to say it correctly. Yeah, someone once said to me, if, if people can learn how to say European writers and thinkers like Dostoevsky, then yes, yeah, certainly we can learn how to say the names of, you know, um, the original people who lived in these spaces. I would add uh, in the spirit of dialogue that we give each other permission, right, to, uh, to make the mistakes, but be willing to be corrected, um, which I definitely am. Dr. Roberts, I want to just uh, give you uh, that, you know, we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, so I don't know if you want to do a final comments uh, from folks. And while you're looking there, I will say that uh, this will be recorded. What we will hope to do, because there's so much great information in, in the chat, we will compile the chat from this and make it available as well with the resources um, on the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion's website uh, where the recording will be housed. Uh, I think I would just end by uh, kind of bringing up what John Lewis has kind of commented. Um, by saying that he says, Brian Stevenson argues that an accurate telling of history is a required first step for justice. So I, I just want to thank you both for being here, uh, Dr. Dowd, for kind of giving us some background on this region, uh, what we really need to begin acknowledging, what we need to learn more about, um, and Dr. Heiser for bringing us into the present and kind of reminding us that these issues are right here. They're staring us right in the face. Um, and so it really is up to us to learn more uh, and to kind of acknowledge uh, and celebrate Native people. And I want to thank you, Dr. Lena Roberts, for bringing this stellar panel together. I uh, just want to acknowledge that, that, uh, that you stepped up and, and pulled this thing together. So I want to, I really say I appreciate you uh, for that. Um, I've learned so much today and I look forward to learning so much more. Um, again, I want to thank all everyone who attended today. Thank you for spending your, uh, your afternoon with us. Um, and I look forward to our next conversation. Um, be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.